neighbor, if you can just press pause in that conversation, that doesn't mean that it ends, but you can pick it back up later. So just pause that convo. We appreciate you. Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Bugs. I am a proud MNPS alum, former teacher, current parent, and I serve as the chair of our Metro National Public Schools Board of Education. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening to really offer your feedback and insights into what the next potential funding formula looks like when we discuss funding at public education in Tennessee. I know we are all very much dedicated to making sure that all 83,000 students in Nashville and a million students across Tennessee actually get the, the quality education that they deserve. That means that they have running water and electricity. That means that they have uh, teachers that are paid a fair wage. That means that they have bus drivers and substitute teachers and every other staff member that makes their lives better, that they are there, right? We just need all the different kinds of resources and we wanna hear from you around what that looks like. We have a very special guest with us. We have Commissioner of the Department of Education, Dr. Penny Schwinn and her team who will be listening to your feedback, taking notes, and then making sure that it is included in the feedback that's offered to the different committees that are helping to develop the funding formula. We're also in a very unique position, actually probably a good position, because a draft of that funding formula framework was actually released yesterday. So we already have a taste of what it might look like, but your insights could help shift or even add to that feedback. So Dr. Schwinn, we appreciate you being here. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to just explain to Nashville uh, constituents of Nashville, community members who are here and those who are watching what tonight might look like, how they can actually offer their feedback, and then what the updated draft might look like or a potential timeline. So thank you for being here. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Hey, good evening. It's nice to see so many folks out here and, and happy to be able to engage in this, uh, what I would consider most important conversation when we're looking at what the future can be for our students, the future we need to create for them, and the way we may create a funding formula that can best serve every single one no matter where they live. So where we are right now in the process, and it's been exciting, we've had thousands of comments and people volunteer and provide feedback is yesterday we released what's called an initial draft framework. And that has been the work of the 18 subcommittees that have now met four times. Um, it is dozens of town halls, both uh, by the department and certainly thank you for the invitation to this one tonight and across the state. We've received a lot of feedback. And the initial draft framework is really an opportunity for us to consolidate that into one document and say this is what we've heard so far and we still have time to go to get even more feedback from folks across the state of Tennessee about what resonates, what might you think differently about, what pushes do you have, what additions might you make, so that as we continue to have conversations and the subcommittees have two more meetings, the steering committee also has two more meetings, we can get to a potential draft formula that again best meets the needs of every single student in the state of Tennessee. That's what a funding formula should do. How we fund our students, how we think about where money goes and what is it's intended to accomplish, that is one of the biggest and most important policy decisions that we make as a state. Because if we do it right, if we ensure that our funding as a state goes to the needs of every child, regardless of where they live, regardless of how they start out, regardless of what their needs might be, that is going to produce significantly better results for our state, but most importantly, give every single child a chance to be successful and to thrive after high school. Our shared goal, and no matter where I've been in the state, genuinely, no matter where I've been, every single person wants what's best for kids. That is a value that I think we can all share and a place where we can start from this conversation. I'm very optimistic that we can get to a really good productive place about a formula that speaks to every child. I'm the parent of two, proud parent of two Metro Nashville students, um, one whose baby Jack's not quite school age yet. And when I think about what this means for my own kids in public school, when they come to school every single day ready with their backpacks on and their pencils and their computers and everything else, I wanna ensure that my kids have the same opportunity as any other kids. But more importantly, I wanna make sure kids in our rural communities and our urban communities, kids who might need a little bit more to do just as well as my kids might do, kids who need more to thrive and be successful, they are all resourced in a way where they can show and live up to that full potential that every single one of them has. So tonight, I'm hoping to get feedback. I'm hoping to hear what y'all have to say, um, what you would like to see in terms of this legacy setting opportunity for education and for funding in the state. Um, I think from a format perspective, I usually just stand up here awkwardly and stare at you while you talk, um, but it's about two minutes. I'm really excited to hear about funding, um, what you might want, feedback, please remember, and I'm sure this, these folks have reminded you, it's all on the record. And so anything, that, uh, anything that's said tonight, we will submit as formal public comment. The subcommittees will review 
every single comment. I personally read every single thing that comes into that inbox. Um, and that will also be shared, collected, reviewed, and considered in those subcommittee meetings and certainly in the steering committee. So uh, we're taking it very seriously, thousands of comments. And like I said, the shared value around what's best for kids is something that is unmistakable and very, very much a theme across this entire process. So appreciate everyone coming out tonight and thank you for the invitation. Commissioner, thank you so much. I know all of you are probably looking about where this voice is coming from. I'm back here behind the desk. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick overview of how we want to do public comment so that everybody kind of understands how it would work, if that's okay with you all. Um, what we have done is the commissioner said, I'll take just about a couple of minutes. I will call names of folks who have signed in. So that QR code that's uh, posted up on the wall, if you have not yet signed in and you would like to speak, please sign in and click yes that you would like to speak tonight. I'll call the name of the person who is up to speak. If you would come to the microphone in the center of the room, everybody gets just a couple of minutes. And I know that uh, this is a very important issue for all of us. We could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we want to get through as many of you all as we can who would like to speak tonight. So I'm going to try to do a friendly reminder and I'm just gonna stand up <laughs> when it gets a little bit close to your two minute time mark. I know that feels a little strange, but that is just my way of work in this room so that you can kind of have an idea that we're about to your time limit and would like to move to the next person. So that way we can kind of keep things going. And if that is, uh, if we are ready to go. Uh, if you don't yes, mind, I just please, have one please. more announcement yes, for the viewing public, for those that are not able to be in this room with us tonight. And for those of you who are and just want to look at the, uh, the, frame, the draft framework or want to submit public comment, please go to tn.gov slash education slash funding. Again, that's tn.gov slash education slash funding. It's pretty intuitive. So with that, thank you, Commissioner Schwinn. Thank you. Feel free to start calling names. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that. So the first speaker tonight is going to be Mr. Tom Surface. Following Tom is going to be Ms. Ashley Beard. And so Ashley, if you want to kind of prepare to go next. And Mr. Surface, if you are ready to go, I will start your two minutes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. We need a bigger pie. This is awkward. <laughs> my story is that um, my main career was in IT. I managed groups with 30, 40 people. I managed budgets of millions of dollars, thousands of servers, um, and had success. I, uh, I took a detour. I went, got my master's to teach. I went and taught at a local Nashville high school, a large one. Uh, I had 150 teenagers trying to teach them algebra and geometry. Um, it was more than I could handle. I did not have the resources, um, didn't have the technology. So that's what we need. You know, so in, in terms of how to split up the pie, certainly we need better pay for teachers. We need more. Uh, uh, resources around technology. We need um, counselors and uh, uh, social workers in the schools. Um, and, uh, but really, we just need a bigger pie for all. Um, I think that uh, the, um, I'm a national native, not native, national resident. I'm in District 9, Abigail. Tyler's district, I voted for her and I will vote for uh, school board every time it comes around and I will vote for people that, that uh, think about our kids first and make sure we get the resources for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Surface. We are gonna hear from Ashley Beard at this point in time. So Ashley, if you would come up to the mic, please. Next up will be Mr. David Williams. So David, if you would like to go ahead and get ready, you'll be next. With that, Ms. Beard, please go ahead with your two minutes. Hi, I'm here to discuss the need for more funding to address the training needs um, of staff and hiring more competent mental health uh, professionals. Um, since my five-year-old began school in kindergarten in the fall, he has been dragged, carried, and locked in a small room multiple times I have received no less than 20 phone calls from, from school staff asking me for help because they don't know what to do. They can't calm him down. I've had to cash in my 401k to hire a lawyer 
before I was able to get the school to agree to testing. But that doesn't help my son now. That doesn't help the teachers and the support staff right now. Every day, I worry that my son will be hurt again by another overworked, overstressed, underpaid worker at the school. And how do I know that services will be available when it's determined that he has special needs, which he likely is? These children and frontline staff need more training, support, supervision, and leadership than they are currently receiving. And undoubtedly, this will require a lot more financial resources than they are currently receiving. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Beard. Uh, next up, as I mentioned, is Mr. David Williams. Following David Williams will be Hope Hall. So Hope, if you can be on deck to speak next. With that, Mr. Williams, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Thank you, good evening. Uh, my name is David Williams. I'm the Executive Officer of Teaching and Learning here in Metro National Public Schools. <clears throat> there is a proposed section in the framework to provide a per student bonus for performance on things like ACT, AP exams, dual enrollment, et cetera. Inherent in this proposal <clears throat> is the assumption that if teachers only worked a little harder, that students could achieve more. In other words, that on occasion, teachers sometimes leave their best lessons at home, content with current levels of student performance. This language also echoes of a business model incentive program predicated on selling or producing widgets in mass instead of working in education aimed at pursuing the development of thoughtful, compassionate, and intelligent citizens. Socioeconomic status, more than any other factor, has been and continues to be the factor most closely correlated to student achievement. Therefore, this proposal seems to be a bonus for the already more affluent schools and districts in Tennessee. Furthermore, because levels of educational attainment and outcomes generate positive economic externalities, it is also already the case that districts and communities with high performing students receive a financial bonus. Because there is only a finite amount of funding, this proposal would essentially direct funds away from students who truly need additional resources to achieve equitable outcomes more commensurate with their peers. Bonus funds will take away opportunities and resources for students on the wrong side of the achievement gap, and this seems backwards to me. <clears throat> when done right, student-based budgeting seeks to improve equity, increase transparency, and expand flexibility for districts and schools. Providing incentives does not serve any of these goals. When not done well, districts like MMPS will continue to bear the burden of filling the gap between state funding and the resources required to achieve educational excellence for all its students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. Next up is Hope Hall. Hope, if you would come up to the microphone. Following Hope will be Honey Harris. I think I've got that last name right, Honey Harris. So Honey, you will be up next. With that, Ms. Hall, oh. please go ahead and get started. It's a little taller than I am. Um, I'm Hope Hall, I'm a librarian, um, which is a very important job in our state. And we would love to have a state librarian coordinator. So I'm sorry, you guys, I have to plug that every time. Um, Librarians and teachers especially have been going beyond, given that, for example, in our district, we're now basically a one-to-one -one school. Um, we do need additional funding for support for doing that kind of a role. Also, um, I really had, I have to be honest, hadn't planned to speak, but um, I want everyone here just for a moment to think about this, maybe close your eyes if you want to. I wanna ask you all some questions. If you were 24, if you were 25, would you go into debt to teach school right now in the current environment? What would you say to your son or daughter if they were considering this as a lifestyle, not just a job, it's a lifestyle? You know, I'm here, haven't been home in 12 or 13 hours. Um, teachers are not getting raises this year. They're getting paid still not in line with nationally what they should in Tennessee. And do you know, I don't know, Dr. Schwinn, but what is our ranking for teacher pay currently this year in Tennessee? Do you know what rank we are? I'm so sorry, because I was going to say it, and then. It can be interactive. That's OK. Oh, oh good. Uh, <laughs> well, then I would have. I'm happy to. Um, so, so we look at what we call the southern regional area, so everything within that space. On salary, we're right in the middle. The difference, though, and we'll, that this website is on our, it's, this link is on our website. There's actually a dashboard to play with. The insurance 
and the uh, retirement contributions are higher in Tennessee than they are in our neighbors. So the take home is where we really see a pretty significant difference in teacher salary in particular in our region. Now nationally, the average Tennessee ranks about where we are with total education funding. Well, which is usually and, like, and like I said, to anybody in a district or state wide office, and I've been doing this for 30 years, both at the state level local philanthropic level, and actually am happier at the school level, or was, um, that right now what you're seeing is everybody, I'm gonna tell you, you can, they deserve bigger, you know, everyone supports stuff, everybody needs to have a living, you know, be able to live where they are teaching and working. The second thing that really bothers me, and we don't have time for this, is our team's assessment, particularly, uh, tying that into any kind of teacher pay, um, being, you know, receiving evaluation. And, and so I really want to see the state and MNPS look at that again and why are, you know, is that really doing what it needs to do? And I just would ask everybody to think about not building in these obstacles for teachers because that's building in obstacles for your children. Thank you so much, Ms. Hall, for your comments. Next up is Honey Herrick. Uh, following Honey will be Molly Hedgewood. So Molly, if you would be ready to go next. With that, Ms. Harris, please go ahead with your two minutes, ma'am. Said it right the first time. First person, Here. long time. Oh, good. Um, okay. And this is my son, and I promise you, he has two shoes. When I came here, he had two shoes. So, um, I am in, uh, I teach at Tulip Grove Elementary School. I'm a support staff member. I have dedicated 23 years of my life to Metro. I have a 27 year old and I have this 10 year old. And I'm gonna be here for a little while longer. Um, and that was a great segue into what I wanted to talk about. But first, let me say, this is the first year in a long time that I like my board and my superintendent. So I wanna say that and go on the record right now, and that's, I'm glad you said it on the record. I like my board and my superintendent, and I feel we're at a good place because I think they have our best interests, not just teachers, not just bus drivers, they have the children's interests and support staff for a change. I am a support staff member in special education. And I'm glad you talked about the funding for the teachers. Fund me. We need a dedicated funding stream to support staff. So when you're looking at your formula, understand you want the teachers and the bus drivers and the support staff to be a team, fund us like we're a team. <laughs> Not doing that. Not doing that. Because I have to fight every year to get money. Every year. And I say this all the time, when you starve me, you starve an MMPS student because he's at home and depending on my paycheck. But like I said, this is the first time in a long time I am champion and cheerleading for my school board and my superintendent. She's mine. <laughs> so, and I think she has my best interests. I want the state to have my best interests because again, when the state starves MMPS, you starve MMPS students because my son is a student depending on my paycheck. And shout out to Tulip Grove Elementary. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Harris, for your comments. Next up is Molly Hegwood. Following Molly is going to be Angeline Quimbo. Kimbo. Uh, so if you could be on deck to go next, that would be great. And with that, Molly, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. I wish that Angelie had gone first because I think that would have been great. She's a former English learner. But my name is Molly Hegwood. I'm the executive director of the MNPS Office of English Learners, serving over 17,500 EL students in Metro Nashville Public Schools. Our students bring, oh, that's the end. I'm very proud of it too. Our students bring tremendous assets to our school district, the city of Nashville, and the state of Tennessee. Data shows that once EL students exit the EL program, they academically outperform their peers. This morning, I had the opportunity to welcome two different families with six children from Afghanistan as they started their US educational journey. 
their families have come here to continue to fulfill their dreams and aspirations for their children. And we, in Metro Schools, have the privilege to serve their fam this family and students. Tomorrow, these six students start in our middle and high schools. The, the students deserve high quality language and content instruction. DARI translation and interpretation services, adequate mental health support in their language, and family resources. The story of these six students represent only a fraction of the experiences and needs of Tennessee English learners. As we speak about student-based funding for EL students, I want you to think about these six students and what they will need to be successful. I was pleased to see the unique learning needs wait listed in the draft framework. As the committees continue to refine this tiered approach for English learners, they must take into account these three items. We must think about the grade brand, the student enters US schools. Number two, they must think about the, link, the length of time the student has been enrolled in school, in US schools. And number three, they must think about the student's language proficiency level. With an ambitious weight for English learners, we would have the following, a lower ratio of EL students to teachers as required by state board rule, robust translation and interpretation services, EL professional development for all teachers, and bilingual family resources. Let's think about these six students as we're making decisions for the EL weight so that we can give them and all English learners in Tennessee the individual support that they need. Thank you so much, Ms. Hudwood. Okay, up next is Angeli Kimbo. Following Angeli will be Kelly Peterson. So Kelly, you will be up next. With that, Ms. Kimbo, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Thank you. Um, hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Angeli Kimbo. I am a student at Hillwood High School. I'm also the senior student representative for MNPS, and I serve on Nashville's Mayor's Youth Council. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Schwinn, the Department of Education, and Mayor Cooper for providing this opportunity for Nashville students and families. Um, the conversation about reimagining re funding and resources for schools is more important than ever. As a student at MNPS for all 12 years of my primary and secondary education, I, along with MNPS's diverse student population, have benefited greatly from the presence of adequate funding and resources, as these two factors have laid the necessary foundations to facilitate learning and thus foster success. And I'm aware that a large portion of the funding for MNPS is through our city, and it would be helpful if the amount, of coming, um, the amount coming from the state can be increased for large urban districts like Nashville. As a student who came, from M who came to MNPS as an English learner, I really appreciate the support that comes with EL teachers and the district's efforts to utilize such support to truly accomplish their mission to make every student known. In November, I had the opportunity to welcome EL teachers prior to a day-long virtual conference led by the Office of EL. I expressed my excitement for these teachers and the students felt positive, positively influenced for I navigated learning the English language alone. Um, it is with these forms of support coupled with the support we give our teachers that in turn will benefit our students that will ripple change for better learning environments for all students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kimbo. Appreciate those comments. Next up is Kelly Peterson. Following Kelly is going to be Patricia Fleming. So Patricia, you will be up next. With that, Ms. Peterson, please go ahead and get started. Good evening, my name is Kelly Peterson. I'm an MMPS parent with children in District 4. After having reviewed your initial draft, I have some concerns. I agree with the majority of what you have in the base part of your funding formula, but I am very concerned at the lack of definition of district-specific needs. You need to come up with a plan that is extremely specific and does not allow for some districts getting something that others don't. Funding should not play favorites and should be based on the students' needs. I agree that students in poverty, ELL students, and those with unique learning needs require higher costs to follow those students as there is more cost to educate them. It is my hope that in this you are considering the teachers, support staff, and professional development it takes to educate those students, which leads to a higher weight. I do not agree with an amount of weight being designated to charter schools as they are already supposed to be under local control and get money in that manner. They do not need more money on top of what they already get. I'm also concerned about designating rural schools as weights as well. I recognize there are challenges for rural schools and there also is for urban schools. How will you make funding for both be as equal as possible? 
The waiting part of the formula feels like it is intentionally trying to cut money away from urban districts and give more to rural districts. I want to know how you will make it so funding is distributed fairly regardless of where a child lives. You didn't detail how unique learning needs will be weighted. Why is this less important? I would argue that unique learning needs should have more weights than whether a child lives in a rural location. This is not something that is unique to either urban or rural. I do not like any of the direct funding that you have except for CCTE. This is a vital thing that should be given to every school in the state to better prepare students for life after school. The tutoring part is a load of crap. It's currently, we can't find tutors for programs that exist. By giving more money in the base or weighted portions of the plan, you could do away with the need for tutors because they would be getting the needed attention in the school setting. Fast growing districts is just another way to funnel money away from urban districts. Give higher weights for items in the earlier part of the formula to make it truly student based instead of using this formula to slight districts you don't like. As far as outcomes is concerned, you should toss that out the door too. The funding formula should be distributed as fairly as possible with the exception of weights for students that cost more to educate. The whole idea is for money to follow students to the schools they attend instead of the state's education department getting to give money to people they like. The reality is that the state is, has a large surplus. We should be putting that money to use and fully funding all schools across the state. Why do we as a state settle for being 45th in terms of where we stand in education in this country? While we're at it, stop trying to slide voucher legislation by without the public noticing. If it's not good enough for all 95 counties in Tennessee, it's not good enough for two of them. It's just another way to take away from public education. It's a constitutional right in this country. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much for your comments. I think you all can hear me. Yeah, okay. Um, next up, <clears throat> we have Patricia Fleming. Following Ms. Fleming will be Patrick Walker-Reese. So Patrick, you are on deck for the next speaking slot. With that, Ms. Fleming, please go ahead and get started. Hi, I wanna thank everyone for inviting each and every one of us. This is a very important meeting. As we all know that there are some serious issues with our schools, the way funding is done, um, uh, this is not to beat anybody up. It's to help come up with a resolution and a, a, a process that works better for our students. I have a couple of personal issues. I have a first grader or a third grader. He has recently tested at a first grade level. We are in January. Why are these not done at the very beginning of school? These aptitude tests need to be done immediately after enrollment and get this on board. These children are left behind and this is no joke. If anybody has any children that is struggling with their education, we're failing them and this is the truth. We have no child left behind. We have abdicated to left to um, for the schools to hold them back so they can get equipped for that grade that they're supposed to be in. We are now told, oh, you were too late. We have a student that is um, in high school. That was an elementary. We've got one in all three grades. So a high schooler, she has some learning disabilities, bad. We just found out where she tests at. Why, how? I mean, our money is coming to you all. We know that where these fundings are. We see what you're trying to do, but it's not a balance. This is just schools, buses. We have a child after school today to get caught up on his education and was left at the school. This is all tonight. And this is so important for each and every one of us to pay attention to what the schools need from us as parents, citizens, grandparents, we're all part of this community. So we let's do better. We need to balance these fundings. That's all there is to it. Get early assessments, beginning of school, that should be done. We're five months away from children getting out of school, five months. And we just found out. I just wanna thank everyone for hearing these major concerns and they are extremely important and we all need to watch what we're doing with our money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fleming. Appreciate those comments. <clears throat> Next up is Mr. Patrick Walker-Reese. Following Mr. Reese will be uh, Nancy Pendleton. So Nancy, you will be on deck to speak next. With that, uh, Patrick, please go ahead and get started. 
Hey, how are you? My name is Patrick Walker Reese. Uh, I had no intentions on speaking tonight, but when I checked in, he said if I click no, I couldn't change my mind. And so um, I'm an advocate, a lifelong educator. I'm a product of Metro Nashville Public Schools. I graduated from Hume Falls, but I grew up in East Nashville, zone for the Stratford Cluster. I always tell the story of going to Hume Fogg the very first day, and for the first week of school, we walked to Tennessee State Avon Williams campus to take the PSAT. And I would catch the metro, the city bus, and come home, and I would ask my friends that went to Maplewood and Stratford, like, yo, what y'all do to school today? And they was like, yo, we watch movies. And that went for 10 days. And I remember at 14 telling my, telling my mom, like, if we've been taking the PSAT for seven days, and they've been watching movies for seven days, they'll never keep up with us. And that consisted for the next four years. Um, and so I'm here today to advocate for social emotional learning. Um, I didn't know that what Tom Ward had us experiencing at Hume Fogg was social emotional learning. I thought everybody argued about the great Gatsby and Thoreau with their English teacher until I became uh, older and I started doing student teaching. I remember leaving Tennessee State and going to Pearl Cone for the first time and seeing chains on the library and being blown away because for four years I never had a hall pass. And so today I have the privilege of working with schools all around the country and getting people to understand. And I was so privileged to see the young lady here. I think she said Hill Wood, right? What she displayed was some of the key principles that we talk about in social emotional learning. We saw her vision today and where she can go. We saw her passion. We saw her strengths. We saw school connectedness. We saw public speaking. The reality, like the lady you said before me, most of these students will never catch up with reading and math just because we don't have the time. I tell parents all the time that you're gonna have to read an hour a day with your child every day for the next five years to catch them up if they're two to three grade levels behind. The same way that if your son wants to go to the NBA, he has to figure out how to play basketball six hours a day like Steph Curry and Chris Paul. There is no difference, right? And so I think the best use of our funding, especially when we consider the amount of students that will never catch up, is how do we figure out what their visions, their passion, where their strengths lie, educate around that. And I think social emotional learning is the best way to catch up, especially for some of our brown and black students who already were a couple of steps behind when we talked about the social economics. So if social economics is a struggle, social emotional learning is probably the way to help fix it. That's what I'm here to say. Thank you so much for your comments. Next up, we have Miss Nancy Pendleton. Following Nancy will be uh, Jeff Preptit. I know I got that last name wrong. Prepit, maybe? Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, you're on, <laughs> on deck for next. Um, with that, Miss Pendleton, please go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Nancy Pendleton, and I teach ninth grade math at McGavick High School. Um, the majority of my students are English learners, including one sheltered math class for students who are brand new to the country. That class includes 30 students from all over Central America with three more refugees from Afghanistan registering today. Um, from, a quick count, from a quick count, 33 is about a third of this room. So imagine me with about a third of this room trying to teach them trying to work through language barriers, trying to build background knowledge, trying to navigate the emotional roller coaster that is being a teenager in a new country, all while teaching them the intricacies of exponential functions. That being, that being said, I'm excited to hear that your new funding proposal gives more weight and funding to students who are learning English. I think that's super important. Um, but I'm here tonight to ask you to do two things. First, to lower the ratio of teachers to all students, and particularly for um, newcomer English learners. Teaching 35 students at one time is impossible. Um, and second, increase the weight of funding for newcomer English learners who join our state in high school if they arrive to the country when they're older than 14, 15, 16. Both of these would allow for smaller class sizes to promote greater growth both in English and in their content areas. It would further allow for more teachers, social workers, translators, and resources in the building that we need to support the many emotional, academic, linguistic, and social needs of these students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pendleton, for your comments. Next up is Jeff Preptit. Uh, following Jeff will be Lynn Hoyt. So Lynn, you are on deck to speak next. With that, uh, Jeff, please go ahead and get started. Thank you, good evening. My name is Jeff Prepti, and like many of you all, I'm a product of the Tennessee public education system. I'm also a product of English as a second language, as we called it in the 90s. <coughs> um, and so I have seen how public education can be a good and a social elevator as it is meant to be. But right now we are failing to meet those metrics. As it stands, fourth graders in this state are 23% proficient in writing, 35% proficient in reading, 41% 
40% proficient in math and 41% proficient in science. I believe the reason why we have such abysmal proficiencies is because for too long we have not dedicated the resources that our education system needs. Right now, only 2.56% of our entire state budget is dedicated towards funding education. There's no reason why, those, why that percentage should, should continue to exist. I believe it's because of those, that percentage, why we are having such abysmal health, such abysmal educational outcomes. While looking at the BEP, currently as it stands, if, a, if an elementary school has 300 students or less, they only have a part-time, they only have enough funding for a part-time librarian. Does not guarantee that they have a librarian. When we have students, when we have fourth grade students who are only 21% proficient, proficient in writing and 35% proficient in reading, that, that is unacceptable. I think across the board, we need to ensure that we have adequate resources dedicated to our education system. Likewise, as a criminal defense attorney, I see specifically the school to prison pipeline and how specifically with the Teacher Discipline Act that was just passed does very little to, to, uh, to halt those uh, harmful practices. Because right now, as it stands in an elementary school, the state only provides enough funding for one counselor for every 500 students. There is no reason why that should exist and we must increase the level of resources that we dedicate to our education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pepti. Okay, uh, next up is Lynn Hoyt. Following Lynn will be Emily Masters. So Ms. Masters, you'll be on deck next. With that, Lynn, please go ahead and get started. Hi, thanks for doing this. My name is Lynn Hoyt. I'm an MNPS parent and I'm a NOAA member. I also had the opportunity to review the bill. I think it's a good start. Living a student-based budget here in MNPS, I see the benefits of weighted formulas and the ability to adjust it to truly target student needs, needs that are many times unique to their schools, their communities, and their school systems. I am worried though, I hope performance incentives don't punish poverty. For Nashville and Pigeon Forge, we need a cost of living adjustment in the BEP. And the tourism zone revenues should not count towards the ability to pay because so little comes back to our city budget. We need to include professional development and more for technology. I'm hopeful, but the pie must be bigger to address all of Tennessee's needs. Our future Tennesseans are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hoyt. Next up is Emily Masters. Following Ms. Masters is going to be Jennifer Hill. So Jennifer, you will uh, be on deck next. With that, Ms. Masters, please go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, again, Emily Masters, hi. Um, I serve on the Metro Nashville School Board, serving District 3. I'm also mom to an eighth grader in MMPS, and I am a product of public education here in Tennessee. Um, so in having a chance to sort of review where, where you are right now, with the um, funding formula, a few questions. Um, first is around English language learners, which a lot of folks have brought up. I didn't see anything really specific around that. Um, do you wanna go back and forth? Whatever works for you, I just didn't, okay. I'm ready to um, So some of what, I, what I'm not seeing. So English language learners, um, transportation, what sort of supports we're gonna receive around that at the state level. And then around the current 47 components of the BEP, such as administrative professionals, what is the funding around that gonna look like? And all are, all are, are all of those being considered as well? Sure, so, and I think this is a really good opportunity to talk about the difference between BEP and a student-based uh, funding formula. So the BEP does have 46 components and it is very specific on ratios for every single one of them. And what a student-based formula produces is it says, what is the base? What is necessary for um, a student wherever they live that we would want to include? So in any proposal that might move forward, anything that is currently in the BEP would move over, any education spending would move over. But this isn't a spending plan. And I think a lot of the feedback really is about how do we want our local districts to spend the money we receive 
And really this is about saying how much money is necessary and what are the big bucket areas. So certainly if we think about English learners and transportation, the weights for English learners should be such that it covers the needs of those students. Um, I know there've been a couple of, of folks I've seen in, in prior town halls, so it's nice to see all again, and certainly with English learners, one of the things we've heard repeatedly is that tiered system, so that it's not just a one size fits all. And we think about things like transportation, we think about instructional materials, class sizes, and what's necessary for those students to be successful. So that would be included in the weight itself. Uh, the weights aren't there yet because we don't necessarily know what a final draft is going to look like. We don't know what the total budget is, and we usually do that after we know some of the, those pieces of information. But all of that is included in the base. And one other thing I just wanted to connect to a prior comment, when we talk about specific district needs, that's not a different amount for different districts. That is saying all these different districts have said that they need, some might want to prioritize SRO, some might want more librarians, some might want all of those things. We have 300 schools approximately that don't generate a full-time principal. And so it is a block of money that is the same for every district, but it is geared towards whatever they might think is best suited for their, those students. So it is fair and the same across the board if it's in the base. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry, ma'am. So in a new form, So the state will generate a formula. That money goes to districts. Local districts decide how that money is allocated. The state will not, does not say how that spending plan is. It is a funding plan. Spending decisions are made at the local level. So, so I can appreciate that. So we're so back to talking about that pot of money and how that is distributed. So uh, there's a lot of waiting around rural concerns. Um, we are a large urban district, so I'm also wondering if you're looking at waiting around cost of living in certain areas. I know that's something that was touched on by Lynn as well. Yes, ma'am, we've received that feedback, um, especially as we're thinking about not just kind of the local contribution, but just how do we think about the formula year over year. Uh, we continue to get feedback on what we do year over year, cost of living adjustments, inflation, et cetera. So that is a piece of feedback. I'm going to say I'm going to take that um, and, and include that as part of the public comment. So I appreciate that. Okay, great. Because we are currently 45th in per student spending and 41st in average salary. And um, that is abysmal and embarrassing. Um, and a lot of the issues around that for our state are, are truly exacerbated here in Nashville and in the large urban districts where we are serving a more diverse population of students, lots of English language learners, lots of wraparound services that we need. So I urge you to take a look at the schools here in Nashville and really give that some thought. Thank you so much for your comments, Ms. Masters. We are going now to Jennifer Hill. Jennifer, you are at the microphone and ready to go. Next up will be Tara Bergfield. So Tara, you're on deck to speak next. With that, Ms. Hill, please go ahead and get started. I'm a MMTS parent, and as an Asheville, there are many things to be hopeful about in this framework as it recognizes the unique learning needs of our students. But because we're a large urban district, I want to make sure that some of these things get plot fully unpacked. Additionally, I need to make sure that we are advancing the fiscal capacity conversation simultaneously with the formula. Otherwise, we're simply going to be shifting the burden to local municipalities. As subcommittees continue their refinement, I hope that the direct weight can be re-envisioned to consider what allows schools to thrive. Rather than educator salaries, can we talk about funding, recruiting, supporting, and retaining educators, leaders, and support personnel? In addition to including counselor, increasing counselors and nurses, can we talk about what it takes to fund inclusive and supportive cultures? We have a tremendous opportunity to adopt a funding formula that inspires communities, families, and educators. Let's bring forward a transformational formula that will couple the funding increases needed to demonstrate our, commitment, our state's commitment to our children and youth. Thank you so much, Ms. Hill. Next up, we have Tara Bergfield. Following Tara Bergfield will be Olivia Oliver. So Olivia, you are up next. With that, Tara, please go ahead and get started. Good evening, thank you for doing this. My name is Tara Bergfeld, and I am an MNPS parent to a second grader. I'm also an employee here. I am the Director of Resource Strategy, and I'm in the unique position of running one of our state's only weighted student funding formulas right now. Um, 
I also fortunately, unfortunately know a lot about the BEP and I'm really privileged to serve on the fiscal responsibility subcommittee. So thank you for that as well. I have a lot of thoughts. I'm gonna try and keep them short. Um, the BEP is always referred to as a funding formula, not a spending plan. And I hope that the next formula that we have is going to retain that flexibility for districts. I know there's been some conversations about if X is funded in the base, should that be the expectation that districts must fund that then? And so I, I appreciate the flexibility that comes within the BEP. I hope that is maintained. Traditionally, the BEP has had ratios that have required school districts to cover 100% of both salaries, retirement benefits, and insurance for many positions beyond what they receive just because of the way the funding formula funds at the ratios it does. I hope that this new formula funds at a lower ratio and also ensures that districts are not covering those additional above and beyond positions. I also hope that this new formula addresses fiscal capacity and the CDF that was mentioned before for the cost of living adjustment. I understand there are unique needs in both rural and urban districts. Um, the cost of hiring certain employees in urban districts is simply higher. There is a different need in rural districts where you may just not have employees to hire. So I recognize those different issues, but I hope that a cost of living adjustment is considered. Right now, our state share in MNPS for instructional components that funds uh, teacher salaries is 46.2% compared to the state average of 70%. So items like that need to be considered when we look at fiscal capacity. With that, I would like to know if there's any effort to address maintenance of effort and how that's going to impact local funding bodies and local effort. And lastly, the BEP currently has inflationary measures for certain components. I would hate to see us do this huge effort to get everybody up to speed and then we don't have any sort of mechanism to maintain this. So a, a giant push is wonderful and I do advocate and I do hope that we have a lot more money because we really can't achieve any of these things without more money. But I would love to see some sort of plan to address inflation in some way for teacher salaries, base costs for textbooks, all of the things that we know go into the cost of educating our students well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, we are round and home base, folks. We've got a few uh, others to hear speak. Uh, next up is Olivia Oliver. Following Olivia is gonna be Leland Evans. So Evan, uh, Leland, if you would please get ready to speak next. With that, Ms. Oliver, please go ahead and get started. I am Olivia Oliver, um, and I'm a sixth grader coming from Weston Middle School. I know my two years in the school that our school supplies are running out in, in my teacher's classrooms, and I'm not sure if it's only my teacher's classrooms, but I noticed that the supplies have run, been running out. My t in my math teacher's classroom, I have noticed that pencils uh, have been disappearing and my teacher had to ask for calculators. As a student in my class, I think the supplies should always be in the classroom and my teacher doesn't have to ask for all these supplies. The, in my ELA t classroom, I have noticed that my teacher has been asking uh, students where the computer chargers have been going. If, st if students have been taking the computer chargers, this is not okay. And I am hoping for the people to put in some money so that teachers uh, will have supplies as long as they need and that not ev that all my teachers and other teachers out there does do, do not have, do will not have to ask for anything else. And that's all I have to say. Ms. <laughs> Oliver, thank you so very much for your comments. Next up is Leland Evans. Following Mr. Evans is Paul Changas. So Paul, you are on deck next. With that, Mr. Evans, please feel free to go, get, go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Leland Evans. I stand before you today 
not only as a parent, but also as a entrepreneur. Uh, I want to first say thank you to everyone that came out here and spoke. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention is the lack of bus drivers. Today on my way here, I got a phone call saying that my school literally has two bus drivers. I have a daughter who I drop off at the bus stop every morning um, to go to kindergarten. And so to understand that before we even get into a classroom, we have to uh, fund the transportation for these kids to get here. So first off, what are we gonna do with that? As a parent, I have to stand out there and wait for my daughter to get to school, sometimes 30 minutes, just to make sure that a bus actually will come so that my daughter can actually get to school. So that's the first thing that I wanna make sure that we understand is very vital to funding the education. But the second thing is to understand that we have to not only just fund the bare minimum of reading, math, science, but also we need to make sure that we are funding education, civic education, to make sure that our children are prepared to take positions such as yours and any other elected official in this room today. We need to make sure that is a priority because as long as we continue to just feed them math and reading and not teach them about positions that are actually controlling what they learn and how they are uh, taught the education that they gain to actually go into this world and succeed, they will never ever succeed. So I wanna make sure that in these budget hearings that we actually uh, fund civic education, which has been taken out as a Metro student uh, once myself. I graduated from John Overton in 2008. My only, uh, my only government education class was a one semester class where I took at the end of the semester a trip to the prison system. I didn't go downtown where we got to meet our elected representatives. I took a 20 or a, about an hour drive to the maximum security prison to see pretty much what they believed was our future. So I wanna make sure that our future and that my child's future is not going to a prison system, but actually going to meet elected officials where they can actually speak their mind like this young lady just did and let you all know that you all are failing us, that you are failing the future, and that if we do not start funding civic education today, that there won't be a future for Nashville. And if we don't start funding bus drivers to get these kids to school, that there will not be a future. So I wanna make sure that it's clear that whatever funding that we do as far as education, that we, one, include transportation so that our kids can get there, but two, make sure that civic education is also funded so that they can be prepared to take over the positions and elected offices that are represented here today. Thank you so much for your comments, Mr. Evans. Next up is Paul Chengis. Mr. Chengis, you are our next to last speaker. Looks like our last speaker is going to be uh, Rachel Ann Elrod. So Ms. Elrod, you will be next. With that, Mr. Chengis, please go ahead and get started. Thank you. I had not planned to speak tonight and then I looked over the draft uh, this evening and decided I, there are a few things I wanted to say. For, for the last 24 years, I'm, I'm over the assessment, research assessment and evaluation department for the district. For the last 24 years, I've been reporting out on the performance of Metro National Public Schools on, on a various assessments. For 12 years prior to that, I worked at the state level reporting out the performance of academic progress in Tennessee based on TCAP tests and other assessments. Over those 36 years, we, we know that we have wide achievement gaps for our English learners, for our students with disabilities, for our economically disadvantaged, our students of color. What I see today when I look at those gaps statewide are very similar to what I saw 36 years ago when we were reporting out at the state. I'm in favor of student-based formulas that address students' needs. And my concern is the outcomes measure that is based on one-time measures of achievement that are highly correlated to socioeconomic status. They seem counterproductive to what we're trying to do when we fund the economic disadvantage concerns. English learners and other students with unique needs. So I hope that's an area that we, we reconsider. But I think it's obviously we all wanna see progress of our students. We wanna see those good outcomes. Let's look, study those, let's learn from those, let's use those as a learning experience and share those resources and those learnings with other students. But again, the funding should be based on need. Thank you so much, Mr. Chengis. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Rachel Ann Elrod, you will round us out tonight. Please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. 
Thank you. So my name is Rachel Ann Elrod, and I represent District 2, about 75,000 national constituents, which is in South Southeast Nashville. And I also have the deep honor of uh, working with my colleagues here on the board um, as vice chair. So I have a couple, I should reframe that, I have several concerns um, about the draft, though I admittedly did not get to see it till late last night, like all of us. My first concern is that there is not immediate response to the fiscal impact concerns that we have. Metro Nashville, only 30% of our funds are by the state. The rest of the 70% are by the city, which is just continuously not able to be done. It's not fair to national taxpayers, nor is it favorable to any of the other people that are having to fight over those property tax dollars. Are there concerns or are there future conversations about managing that fiscal impact? May I have an answer to that? Gonna get the microphone. Uh, yes, so th that will be an ongoing conversation. We've had eight town halls specifically on that. We will continue to have those conversations. Right now, the feedback and public comment has been split. Um, about half of folks want to do that in, in conjunction with this conversation. The other half want to see what the state contribution will be and then make sure that anything that's developed for local contribution, um, whether that's match and then certainly the maintenance, the MOE conversation, uh, that they know what that, that total dollar state investment would be so that they can better plan and map. And so we're continuing to get feedback on that particular topic and welcome that as part of the public comment over the next couple of weeks. Um, the fiscal impact obviously impacts us in Sevier County the most due to the way that we obtain some of our taxes and of course other counties as well. It's a deep concern and it obviously affects MMPS which is my priority and my main concern. I would like for us to make sure that that is a priority as again, excuse me, um, I would really appreciate that we had a better and a more equalized amount of funding, as again, it is not popular, nor is it available to us to have 70% of our funds provided by the city. Um, additionally, I am also concerned, as also has been stated, that Tennessee is rated 47th in the nation on funding level and funding effort. And then of course, as we have mentioned, that varies greatly among different counties, and there's a disproportionate burden on our local governance. Um, that funding is, of course, shown in different ways, and of course, also the outcomes of that funding is shown, not just in test scores, but also in things that are happening within our communities. I appreciate that we're going to have a weighted investment. I want to make sure that we're looking at all the different kinds of ways that it affects students, not just in the absolute need for us to have um, better ratios for our counselors and psychologists, but also to affect other additional changes, whether it's in English language learners or other things. Uh, recently, uh, Tennessee's 2021 State of the Child Study, which was done by the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth, had some really shocking statistics. And those are what I would consider outcomes that have come from within our schools as well. And that's one in five children live in poverty. 42% of households have trouble paying for their usual expenses. Childhood vaccinations have decreased by at least 39% just in the past year. The number of students supported by TEIS has doubled since 2011. If you do not know, if that student is in uh, TEIS at age three, they become the responsibility of the school system. One in three young adults are reported feeling down, depressed, or helpless. And 58% of young adults are reported feeling anxious or on edge, which was the highest um, report in the country. And that more, the one in six Tennessee high school females reported experiencing uh, physical dating violence in 2019, which was also the highest in the country. Um, those findings all have very complex solutions, and I understand that they're not going to be immediately resolved by the next two cycles of education. But all of those solutions are expected to be found within our schools. And so I would like for us to be able to say that we're noticing those and that we are funding for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Elrod, for your comments. That will conclude the folks who have signed up to speak tonight. So I want to thank everybody. I want to uh, just really quickly remind you all, uh, tnedu.funding at tn.gov. I know Chair Bugs might say the same thing, uh, but we have uh, those public comments that are open. So I'll turn it back over to you, ma'am. No, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and really appreciate the Tennessee Department of Education for graciously accepting our offer to host uh, the first town hall in Nashville. Uh, my colleagues and I appreciate hearing from the Nashville community. Speaking of my colleagues that I did not introduce earlier, we have student board members that you all heard from Anjali Kimbo, just a, a bright spot in our at our board table. Um, 
Board member Jeannie Pupo Walker, board member Emily Masters, board vice chair Rachel Ann Elrod, board member uh, Frida Player, and then board member Franchata Bush. I also just, doggone it, and, uh, and board member John Little. But I also, if you are a parent in MNPS, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand so I can kind of get a thank you all so much because I know your babies are home waiting for you or here with you waiting to go home. Raise your hand if you're an MNPS employee, a part of our family in that way. Thank you all so much. And, and to anyone that didn't raise your hand, we especially appreciate you just being here as a community at large member. So if I could talk to you in a second, I can, I'm can. i sure I can help you uh, get to some resources. But uh, thank you all so much. Feel free to reach out to your board members, reach out to the CDOE. Thank you for being here. I'll be right with you. You don't have to go home, but good night. <laughs> This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.